Something like that always happens. So we are uh, we're watching uh, Ted Morton with Pet Shark. He's going to be my guest today. And uh, let's move this over a little bit. Bomb on stilts. Thanks for uh, for continuing the subscription. That's awesome. Seven months. That's awesome. <laughs> Badass. Um, let's see here. All right. As usual, uh, we're here to just uh, talk about. Being a working artist and man, listen to that. I jumped in too soon. Take yourself off of mute there. And, uh, sure. Nice. Oh, very good. All right, man. Awesome. That's uh, that's from the Coach House in 2019. Um, man, that's a that's a great venue. It's kind of like I think it's been kind of considered like a sister to Belly Up or the other way around. Yeah. But that looks like a fairly large place. What's uh, what yeah, kind of what kind of capacity? I think it's around five, five fifty or five fifty something. I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but somewhere around there. Yeah, and that's uh, how many how many times have you been there? Oh gosh, um, I've played there so many times, and and I've attended shows there so many times. Like I can't even count. You know, I've been there so much. That's kind of like uh, maybe maybe uh, a home base kind of club for you, or. Yeah, because yeah. it's very close to where I live. So nice, yeah. excellent. Well, Ted here. I've I've met him a few times out and about. Uh, typically at uh, like Nam, and then um, we've I've, I've met him at shows out. Uh, I was there when you were uh, uh, playing with uh, or opening up for Brand X, which was man, that was a great show. Um, that was, you know, Brand X had had uh, Kenny Grahowski playing for him at the time, 
and uh, fabulous drummer. Oh man, he's he's one of my favorites. Yeah, he's so good. Um, you know, I've I've been following him in Secret Chiefs Three and um, and Imperial Triumphant, and uh, he he does some other stuff with uh, a, a um, oh what is it called, um, Abraxas, which is something I think that, that was one of the John Zorn related projects. Really, really amazing stuff. Yeah, in fact, uh, the show you're watching. Uh, right now is the show that we opened for Brand X. Oh, nice. So there was a, so this was probably, was this right after the uh, Ramona show? Uh, yeah, we were on a run with them. So we did like, I don't know, three or four shows in a row with them. Oh, wow. And we got it back up on screen again. Man. Wow. So that, that must have been fun. The, the bass player for, uh, for Brand X was one of the best bassists I've, I've ever seen I think I mean he was, yeah, he was kind Jones, of a phenomenal player man he was he was pretty incredible totally oh man very nice all right nice so uh, tell us a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, some of my friends here might not be. Uh, well, I got a lot of friends here that are not from the area. We've we've got QB uh, is in Spain, I believe. He's in the chat. I'm sorry you can't see the chat. That is one of the one of the uh, one of the downsides to doing it um, uh, remotely like this. Yeah, no worries. Um, but uh, you know we'll, we'll have people interacting in the uh, in in the uh, channel chat and and uh, if you've got any questions for Ted um, throw them at us uh, but uh, yeah tell us a little bit about your background uh, my background gosh um, how far how far do you want to go <laughs> uh, wherever um, you want to start really I mean uh, what uh, what got well, you started give, in music I'll give you a brief synopsis then um, all right I started um, at the age of five uh, playing piano as a lot of kids do at that age. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I, um, you know, so I started to learn to read from a very early age. I would, took formal lessons with, a this old German guy named Mr. King, you know, one of those guys that would slap the back of your hand, you know, if, <laughs> yeah. if you, uh, veered off the script, so to speak. And, uh, or if you weren't playing on time to the metronome Yeah, and, um, I took lessons with him for about three years, and then I ventured into, I wanted to play trumpet, so my mom bought me a trumpet, and um, and then uh, played trumpet for a couple of years, got fairly proficient at that, and then, um, and then I wanted to try my hand at guitar, and I mean, all the while, um, all this, all that time, I really wanted to be a drummer, yeah. you know, but my parents were really reluctant to purchase me a drum set. Well, I can, you know, <laughs> I uh, can understand. It takes a special parent, you know, yeah, to raise a drummer, <laughs> as you know. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, so I got a guitar um, when I was about 10. And my sister was a classical guitar player and, you know, playing the Frederick Node stuff and, the, you know, the nylon string stuff. Yeah. And um, so I got a cheap guitar that i saved up a bunch of uh, blue chip stamps for and um as soon as my parents saw that i was really taking to it and doing well um with the lessons with my sister um that christmas they and they broke down and bought me a yamaha a nice yamaha wow. classical guitar and okay. Actually, nice. it was the very first time I ever played live in front of an audience was on guitar, playing a duet with my sister. Interesting. And she was, um, you know, she's six years older than I was at, well, she still is. And um, so she was a high schooler at the time. And I was just a, I was just a little kid, basically, um, tagging along with her and learning from her. Yeah. And um and then when I turned eight, when I turned 13, um, you know, I begged and begged and begged my parents for a drum set for so many years. And I was, you know, pounding on the couches and chairs and driving my mom nuts in the car, you know, pounding on the back of the seats, you know, with my hands and, 
you know, they finally broke down and bought me a drum set on my 13th birthday. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and the rest is history, man. I just, I dropped every other instrument I was playing and I just, I just soaked up everything drumming that I could at the time. I took two drum lessons and then I was self-taught until I was in my mid twenties. But during my high school years, you know, I played all the backyard parties, you know, I was in a, an originals band and I actually ended up getting signed to a record label when I was 18 years old. Oh, wow. And, um, so I was playing at a fairly high level at that time. And, um, and of course that whole record contract fell apart within a year and I was left without a band and a record contract. And, oh no. And then I was like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do now? You know? What was, uh, what, what was the name of the band? The, the, well, we went through a couple of weird band iterations. Uh, one was, one was we called ourselves late because we were always <laughs> late everywhere we went at the time. Yeah. Uh, another name we had was lazy. And then the other, um, the other name we, we had was uh, Dr. Robert. And it was kind of named after my dad because my dad was, was a doctor and his first name was Robert. All so, right. um, so we kind of went through that name change. So we went, a, went through a few different name changes and, and all that, um, played a lot of gigs and, uh, you know, did some recording with the label and, um, until it just fell apart, the guitar player ended up leaving the band for personal reasons. Yeah. And we could never find a, a guy to replace him. And he was a principal songwriter. And so the whole thing just fell apart. And I was left just, you know, going, what the heck am I going to do? And then uh, a buddy of mine, um, a guy I went to high school with, he happened to be the uh, quarterback on the football team, a guy named Steve, who's still a good friend of mine, by the way. Um, he prompted me to go to school. And, uh, so he was like, come on, get in the car. We're going to go sign up for classes. And I'm like, well, what are we going to take? And he's like, we're going to take fire science. And I was like, what's fire science? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and he's like, you know, be a fireman, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so I started down that path and, um, uh, I, I went whole hog into trying to become a firefighter and, I finally, a few years later down the road, I ended up getting hired on the fire department and uh, made a whole, you know, 30 year career becoming of uh, being a firefighter. Man. And all that time I was playing, uh, I was playing a lot of drums, primarily in the church. I had become, you know, I'd become a Christian and um, I was invited to play in lots of churches and I ended up um playing with, uh, you know, a lot of gospel artists like mm. Crystal Lewis and Daryl Mansfield and, you know, Dennis Agagini and, and, you know, playing some really big gigs with these people, you know? And, uh, so that was really during my entire tenure as uh, a firefighter, I was primarily playing in the church world, you know, yeah. the gospel world. And, yeah. um, you know, doing the occasional, you know, obviously playing, you know, uh, regular bar gigs and things like that at the yeah, same yeah. time. So, you know, so I, I would say I really cut my teeth on, on, on church stuff primarily yeah. and, you know, throw in uh, a lot of cover gigs and stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, so when I retired from the fire service, I, I thought, you know, I just, I'm just going to go whole hog into drumming and just make it, you know, my second career and, or at least give it a go, you yeah, know, yeah. and become a professional drummer. Um, so I would say I was playing semi-professionally as a firefighter, you know, as I was working as a professional firefighter. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, and then when I retired from the fire service, um, I just went whole hog man and just, just jumped in, you know, uh, with both feet. And yeah. I mean, like, Last year I did about 142 dates 
uh, live dates. And um, I've been playing with um, a couple of tribute acts. And uh, yeah. one of them is called the Kings of Queen, which is a king a queen tribute. And the other is a Who tribute, Music of the Who, yeah. uh, which is called Love Rain. And so I've been working with those, both of those bands primarily. Um, and then, uh, you know, I never saw myself as being a, uh, a tribute drummer, so to speak, um, because I was so focused on Pet Shark, you know, for the last 10 years and, yeah. and being a, you know, being a solo act with, with Pet Shark. Sure. And, um, so, yeah, so that's kind of it in a nutshell, I guess. Nice. So, it's, uh, bring on the questions. It is a, a significantly different experience between um, working on your own uh, pet project. Forgive the pun. Um, mm-hmm. So that uh, and, and you know, going from something that that you're really putting your your input and your feed in into, and and going into something where you have to uh, mimic somebody else entirely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's that's a drastically different experience, but. Um, I mean, I've, I've always, I've, I've tried to find joy in, I, I won't say always, I should back that up. I, I've, I try to find joy in, uh, in whichever style that I'm doing, or if I'm, you know, trying to replicate something else. Um, what's, uh, what's been the, the, the biggest challenge for you in, in doing any sort of a tribute act? Like what, what's, what's been something that, that, that maybe was difficult to to get around or to to get a get a handle on if anything um yeah it, it tribute acts definitely do have their challenges um and i think i think the difference between being in a tribute act or just going out and play a covers playing a covers gig where you're you know you're learning 50 songs yeah. Um, and playing all 50 songs or whatever during, you know, for three sets a night playing in a cover band. Um, and primarily just injecting a lot of your own style into those songs. And yeah, mm-hmm. trying to emulate it as much as possible because people still expect to hear it, yeah, yeah. you know, the way they were, they were recorded. Um, but as a tribute act, it's, it's kind of, a uh, a couple of notches higher as far as the level of actually learning that person's style yeah and focusing on that style for the entire show and that has been a challenge um because again i never really saw myself as being that kind of a player where i would be having to emulate another player you know for an entire show yeah um Especially, like I said, after having devoted the last 10 years of my life with Pet Shark and playing my own music, you know, or the music that Keith Moreland and I had written together. Yeah. And um, which is incredibly gratifying to do, you know, when you get the kind of responses that that we get, you know, when we do a live show with Pet Shark. Yeah. And um, it's a it's a really lovely thing. But I will say it's a very it's a very, very difficult sell to, um, to do well, to be really successful in a, an all instrumental act. Yeah. That, and, that's, um, I've certainly noticed that. I mean, many of my favorite artists are primarily, uh, instrumental or, well, like secret chiefs three would be a great example. I mean, there's, there's very few songs that they have any lyrics whatsoever in, um, and that's that's such a I mean most people have never even heard of them or um yeah yeah I mean I like a lot of instrumental music and and most people I've found if they're not really specifically musically inclined uh, tend to be looking for lyrics to to relate to yeah. and if they can't relate to what the lyrical content is it may not grab them um like uh, like a song might grab me because it's got a particular chord progression or or a or a great synth sound, you know, that, that's, uh, um, (laughs) yeah, so that's very interesting. But uh, I wanted to say that I, I kind of recognize maybe a little bit of a parallel. Um, when you mentioned, you know, that, uh, that you were primarily self-taught past a couple of lessons when you first started. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, being in a band that's all your own 
for you know for for a decade and then transitioning to to having to learn something else it is a, a bit of a of a balancing act when you go from because I, I was primarily self-taught as well but i i prefer to say I, I learned by mimicking others so i really wasn't properly self-taught i mean it's not like i materialized that knowledge without finding it somewhere but but uh, yes, uh, without guidance though <laughs> was, was no the, uh, doubt and um, and you know i actually I had hit a wall um, several times as being a, you know, self-taught yeah, drummer yeah. or musician. Um, yeah. I still, you know, I knew how to read music, so I still could, I still could read, you know, drum transcripts. I could still, mm -hmm. and so I learned a lot of music even by just, you know, reading the black dots, yeah. you know, and um, which is a really wonderful way to learn songs, you know, um, quickly instead of having to, I mean, obviously you have to listen to them. And, yeah. But you know, that's, I mean, that's a place where I'm lacking. I mean, I have to learn things from, you know, just, just, you know, absorbing the material, um, mm -hmm. or, you know, just reacting. So, um, right. you know, I mean, I can read, but I'm very, very rudimentary at it. So it's a, you couldn't sit me down and I couldn't, you know, sight read a thing. I, I have had to sight read sessions before, but for very simple songs and, um, you know, that's, that's something where, um, if I do a particularly difficult song, I do have to really, you know, really study it to to get to a point where I can just rifle through it as opposed to, you know, um, reading. You would be able to dissect it and really go, oh, OK, it's doing this here. And that's, you know, this section has got this count. And that section's got that count. And, um, you know, so I've used the the technology to help me along with, you know, tempo maps. And, and I tend to put markers on tracks where, you know where I'll just put a quick little mental note. So I have, I have my own way of charting things and going, okay, it's going to do this there. Um, remember to do X at Y and, um, you know, the rest of it is, is pretty, <laughs> pretty, yeah. uh, rudimentary and, and kind of simple. And, you know, that's a really great way to do it too, is, you know, everybody can count, you know, for the most part. Right. So, sure. I mean, if you can, you can take any song and you can, you know, count the number of bars in an intro yeah. and, and write it down on a piece of paper. And, uh, so you can have your own method and that works for me too. Cause I, I definitely use my own method as well. Um, yeah. for some of the easier stuff, you know, just your kind of run of the mill stuff. Yeah. And, um, it's really the most, the more difficult stuff that I feel like I have to bust out a transcript and actually read through it yeah. to figure it out, you know? A little bit easier a little bit quicker um but yeah i do that too i have uh i i definitely count the measures and i'll just like make notes you know yeah uh, measure one measure you know uh i'll just say intro i'll write intro and then i'll say okay eight bars of intro yeah, yeah. Um, or guitar starts you know or drum start you know um and then i'll write down the bpm so at least i know what the bpm is yeah yeah and um so yeah i have definitely my crude way of mapping songs as well for sure i've um, i've been doing it my own stubborn way for so long that i i almost you know it, it really it for for a lot of parts where we're we're supposed to be counting you know sections i'm i'm just like no it, it just does that here <laughs> and it mm -hmm. does this there you know i'm not even counting along with it i've been so stubborn about it with the the uh um, i guess that that's part of why i when I was younger, I thought I was doing something better by not taking lessons. I was, that's how I was rationalizing. It was, I'm going to be, you know, it's going to be my own way and, yeah. and, and that's going to make it true art, you know? Um, I know. And, and, in, and I mentioned so a little bit earlier that I, you know, I hit a wall, you know, yeah, several know. times and, um, I ended up reaching out to some, some professional guys. Um, and, uh, I actually had one one of the guys um, I'm trying to think of his name right now. Dave Spur. Um, have you ever heard of Dave, Dave Spur? Um, the he name was is Donna Summers familiar. drummer. Okay, no. And, yeah. You know, and but he's I've... also in the in the gospel world too. You okay. know, played with a lot of Christian artists, and um, so I ended up reaching out to him. Um, and this was before cell phones and mm -hmm. you know computers and all that stuff, and so he. He was kind enough to actually, so I, I called him and I was like, Dave, I, 
I've hit a wall. I don't know where to go with my playing. And um, I think I was in my early 20s at the time. And he goes, he goes, why don't you think about, you know, getting getting into lessons? And um, and then he said, uh, I'm going to send you a video of, of myself playing, and I'm going to send you the transcript along with it. Mm-hmm. And so he actually mailed me a, a VHS tape <laughs> and a transcript of what he was playing. And I just digested it. And I, you know, I got re-inspired. And I was like, oh my God, you know, it was so kind of him to do that you yeah. know, for nothing, just as, as a friend. And um, I don't even know if he even remembers doing that. But uh, but then I got into lessons. I, I, I then started studying with a guy named Mark Morales. And, um, and he taught me um, like Latin playing. I really wanted to learn Latin music because yeah. I just love Latin rhythms. And, yeah, me too. You yeah. know, all of that stuff because it's so complex, but it's so rhythmic and it's just yeah. beautiful. And um, and it can be applied in so many different ways in so many different genres of music. Oh, and, yeah. And jazz as well. And so I I went to see Mark for the Latin stuff and he was actually the guy who taught me, you know, back in the, in the mid eighties, he taught me how to play like the Rosanna shuffle. And yeah. So I got totally into shuffle playing and, and, uh, yeah, playing, you know, that kind of stuff. Playing and then country did that for me. I, <laughs> I then went to, um, I went to study with, um, a woman by the name of Cheryl Hall and she was a local drum teacher, but she had studied jazz under Chuck Flores, you know, and Chuck Flores was a well-known jazz guy i think he had subbed on tonight show you know oh, nice. uh, several times wow. and and so she she um turned me on to his method of learning jazz independence you know so you know with the whole foot rocking thing mm-hmm. and you know uh playing the triplets on the ride and and all that stuff um and just playing you know comping over what you're playing underneath and and being able to comp on both, you know, on all four limbs, doing all four limb independence. Yeah, yeah. And so that's really where I learned how to play way more outside the box. Um, and so I studied with her for a while, uh, probably a couple of years, I would say. And, um, and then, um, yeah, and that's it. And then after that, you know, I just started doing um, like master classes and stuff with other drummers, like, uh, um, or I would go for like a tune up with some pro drummer, you know, like, um, so I reached out to um, probably many of the same or some of the same people you have, you know, like Thomas Lang. Yeah. So I reached out to him and, and he, you know, put me through my paces with some. <laughs> pretty crazy exercises yeah, yeah. and um but so helpful man for double drumming double bass drum you oh, know, yeah. drumming and independence and getting your doubles you know to sound a little more even and stuff like that you know <laughs> yeah i still got um, plenty of room to improve there <laughs> yeah and then um and i actually signed up for um todd suckerman's you know six month master class oh, wow. and nice. went through that and quite honestly, I'm still working through those exercises, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's a constant battle, you know, to get better. And I don't see it so and, much as a battle as, as a, uh, I mean, it's really a blessing to have, to have a passion for something that has a never ending potential for improvement. I mean, there's, it's so limitless, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, I, there was, you know, I didn't, I didn't take, I didn't take my first lesson until I'd already been playing about 20 years. Um, and wow. I had okay. really, I had, you know, I had done a lot of work with a lot of different people, all, you know, low level stuff and, um, not like I'm super high level now or anything, but, um, you know, uh, played all over Wyoming a little bit in Colorado and then moved out here and, and played in bands all over San Diego and, and a little bit into LA and a mm-hmm. little bit into Arizona and uh, I had just kind of hit the wall with, with you know, 
really improving greatly because I wasn't putting in the time. Um, and I, that's, you know, right around the same time that I was starting to see, you know, videos of players like Marco Miniman and Thomas Lang and, and, mm -hmm. you know, seeing those guys and just going, okay, that's completely unattainable, you know, Virgil Donati and yeah. seeing all that going on and, and just thinking, okay, there's, you know, that's, I'll never be able to do what those guys are doing. So, mm -hmm. you know, then, then I just kind of got settled into this kind of day job rut and, and playing a bit on the weekends and a little bit at, at night. But, um, um, I, I found on my space, um, I want to say this was, this had to have been like 2008 or maybe, maybe 2009, but probably 2008. Uh, Marco Miniman was living in like, um, Imperial beach at the time. And, yeah. and so, uh, I hit him up on MySpace and asked if if he was doing any in person lessons and and he responded pretty quickly and and so we set something up and I just went down to he had a storage space down there in a you mm -hmm. know a public storage with one of those beautiful DW kits in there yeah and uh, he gave me like a, a, an hour hour and a half lesson for a very reasonable price and let me videotape the whole thing and just filled me with exercises and, and, you know, things that, that, you know, like the, the, you know, finger techniques and, and, mm -hmm. and just, just little exercises to, to really help me uh, get along. And I, yeah. I ended up with like an hour long instructional, you know, in person from Marco Miniman for an extremely reasonable price. And, um, that kind of started, you know, things started to, to, to grow from there. But yeah, yeah. Thomas Lang, I did the, the uh, big drum bonanza a couple of years in a row. Mm -hmm. And each time I did that, it was just like, okay, you're here. And now all of a sudden it's like, okay, the rest of the year, you're just going up and up and up, you know? Then, yeah. As long as you practice the exercises, you yeah, know? Yeah. And, and, and uh, that's the key is, is you've got to do the work. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I was notorious back in the eighties and, you know, early nineties and, and, and even, even up until now, you know, I was just constantly digesting, you know, guys, DVDs, you know, like Greg Bissonnette's D when that first came yeah, out. Yeah. Um, I think I've he was with David upstairs. Lee Roth at the time when he, yeah. that first one came out. And, um, you know, I just, man, I just, it was just on constant rewind and play constant rewind and yeah. play. And so I got a lot out of that. And then also Simon Phillips DVDs or at, at the time VHS tapes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, with his, his so I got into those up. and I was doing all of the, um, the Dave Weckl plus ones, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, all of his, uh, well, he was doing like rock jazz, Latin technique and stuff like that with an accompanying book, you know, yeah, with a cassette yeah. tape, you know? And so I was digesting all those books and, um, man, it was just, it's just been a constant, you know, I've, I, you know, I also was teaching drum lessons myself. Um, uh, I started teaching lessons back in the early nineties and, you know, I had a handful of students at the time and, and that teaches you a lot too, you know, because you have mm -hmm. to really be on your game when you become the teacher. And, um, so, um, and I really took that seriously and, you know, I, I, I still teach to this day. I still have one, I've got one drum student left right now yeah. and, uh, and he happens to be like 70, 77 years old, this guy, you know, who just happened it's, to get back into drumming. It's and, never uh, too late. Day, really? Said, hey, do you, do you still teach? You know? And I said, yeah. So, um, you know, so I, I, ha I still have one foot in that door, you know, but I, I always saw myself more as the player teacher, you know, instead of mm -hmm. the teacher player, you know, because I was still in the playing world, you know, pretty heavily, like much more so than I was teaching. So, um, like I said, and, and that's continued, thank God, you know, the phone still rings and you know, the, the emails still show up and the text yeah, messages yeah. still show up. Hey, you know, can you do such and such a gig or whatever? Um, which is such a blessing because, you know, I'm still, 
you know, I'm 60 years old, man, and I'm still as passionate passionate as as I ever was yeah. um, for drumming. So, and I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. I mean, no. I'm going to keep doing it, you know, until I probably until I draw my last breath, you know. Yeah, so. I, I feel like um, I mean, I'm, I'll be 50 this year, and I'm 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 playing more than I've ever played in my life. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing. I'm I'm playing a lot more aggressively and 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 uh, with much more stamina than I did when I was like 16 because I mean when you're 16 I was you know full of bad technique not that my technique is perfect now but you know how it is we uh we get overzealous and and <laughs> bad grip yep. and breaking breaking symbols and and all that business yeah. well and that's that's one thing all of these, you know, all of the training has certainly helped me with. It was, um, cause I can remember when I was in my mid twenties and I was playing in some heavy, pretty heavy rock bands and, mm -hmm. you know, my, my wrists, uh, you know, I had, I had, I felt like I was damaging myself, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I, I knew I really needed to get my technique game together if I was going to last. Yeah. And, and, and that's why, you know, I, I feel like, you know, getting back into lessons when I was 25 was a real godsend mm -hmm. because, you know, Mark at the time taught me, um, you know, proper, proper stick, stick holding and, yeah. and, you know, finger methods and things like that. And, you know, not, not holding onto the stick so tight, you know, yeah. and that's really where the damage happens, you know? Oh yeah. And so, you know, I've been able to last all these years um, playing at a pretty high level. I mean, I, I just, I just recorded a track for Mike Keneally's new solo album. Oh yeah, I definitely wanted to cool. talk about that. Yeah. You know, I'm still playing at a, at a pretty high level, which is fantastic. You know? Yeah, yeah. And it's all because of that training. And so I think if I had stayed self-taught, you know, um, I think I don't think I would have lasted you know, physically. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. For me, I've just, I've had to do a, a pretty wide variety of, of gigs. I mean, I started off as, as really only wanting to do metal. I wanted to be a metal drummer and, uh, you know, metal is still a huge part of my life, but, uh, but I've never really gotten, you know, work doing it. I've played in some metal bands, but you know, it's always been like a passion project and, you mm -hmm. know, that things happen and eventually, you know, some band chemistry blows up and then you're starting all over. And, and for a while I actually quit playing with other, other, uh, musicians for a couple of years because I got so frustrated with the, the, you know, band politics or, you know, I've said, it's like, it can be like having five girlfriends at once and they're all That's in so the same true. room. And, it's like uh, anything, you know, I mean, yeah. I need, whatever, however many percentage points you want to give it. But I would say it's really, it's 90% the hang, you know, Yeah. and 10% yeah. the rest, you know, Yeah. If you and there's only along. so much time you're going to spend on stage. Um, but man, you got to live with these guys and, and hang out with them and be a team. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge thing. And it, you know, I, I kind of have to liken it back to my fire service training and, and living in a firehouse with a bunch of dudes, you know, and, and women actually. And, yeah. um, um, and it's very much about the team atmosphere, you know, so it's kind of the, uh, when one's working, we're all working or, you know, if somebody's in there cooking, you know, you better be on there in there helping them. You yeah. know, if you got to clean the toilets, everybody's, everybody's doing their duties, you know, in the yeah. morning, you know, it's like, uh, it's just all about the teamwork and, um, other words, you know, like the fire service, it just doesn't work without it. And, um, bands are no different, man. It's like a, yeah. it's a smaller team, but you know, it, it's really tough when, uh, one or more people aren't necessarily pulling their weight or, or just being a jerk, you know? Yeah. So I'll take nice over jerk any day. Yeah. Know? If you if you can't get along with the person you're you're trying to make some sort of art with that I I mean that's either that's either going to implode or or become Fleetwood Mac I don't know I don't know how you find the line <laughs> of of uh you know make steering that direction but 
seems yeah. uh, pretty unlikely that that <laughs> that it'll be the the latter. Pretty much always the yeah. former. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, and and it also ties back to um, you know training and and all that kind of stuff. So you know, it, the fire service is very it's a paramilitary organization, so it's very regimented. You know, there's there's training days. There's you're training all the time, yeah. basically, and that's how I I approach um, playing in bands, um, and I still use those same principles today. You know that I use uh, coming up in the fire service. Mm -hmm. I still see myself as you know uh, training like a rookie. You know for for some of these bands. You know, so like when you ask, sure. well, what's how is it? You know. Um, you know, playing in the tributes and what's different is really not really that much difference other than um, having to really, like I said, focus on that person's style. Like I'll take the Queen band, for instance, uh, the Kings of Queen. It's, um, you know, it's been a challenge learning um, all of Roger Taylor's little idiosyncrasies, you know, of his playing. And, yeah. uh, I'm sure. But it's been, but it's been fun and challenging, and so I have kind of um, tried to look at it as approaching it like a like a rookie firefighter. You yeah. Know? So, kind of um, uh, that uh, another another thing that I wanted to touch back on was you know uh, going in in going from primarily focusing on your own art to doing tribute acts and that sort of thing. Um, I, I found a parallel in that with, you know, uh, doing the, the dance band thing, which I've been doing for the last three years, which uh, is Atomic Groove, is like, uh, you know, I almost didn't take that gig because I'm just not into disco or, uh, you know, Justin Timberlake songs or, or you know, Beyonce and that, that sort of thing. It's, it's, you know, really not not anything that I would ever seek out to listen to. Or Katy Perry, yeah. for instance, or you know any of a, a number of artists that we do, and uh, a, f a friend of mine, Carl King, talked me into doing it. He just said, you know, this is this is something you really need to do. You know, Mike, I'm, I'm having a tough time hearing you over the over the music I'm oh, playing. Oh, sorry, jeez, that's only barely okay. Sorry about that. Oh, interesting. Okay. How bizarre. Huh. Okay. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to test the level of that just really quick here. Cause that, that seems, how's that? Is that <laughs> still the same on my end? It's still the same. It's That's... pretty hot on my end. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Huh. Okay. All right. That's something I'm going to have to work out. Um, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. Now um, I can hear you. Well, that is bizarre. Yeah, it's weird. Okay, I, I'll, um, I'll, have to, I'll have to figure that out later. That's a routing yeah, issue. It was. A, yeah, I could barely hear you um, okay. with what you were saying. Well, and, the uh, the with going into a band that that uh, you know where you're expected to mimic somebody else's uh, style and you know do it pretty pretty authentically. Um, I was relating that to to my experience in joining a dance band, which is playing music that I'm, you know, is not in my cup of tea at all. You know, um, yeah. you know, lots of disco stuff, and and um, you know, I, I mentioned Katy Perry, I mentioned Beyonce or Justin Timberlake, or you know, any of that stuff just wasn't exciting for me. And, yeah. And my friend Carl King talked me into it by saying, "Look, you know, this is an experience that you just need to do." just to have the experience even if you only do it for a little while this is something you really should do right and it's it's turned into being one of the most fun gigs i've ever had um, it's a blast isn't it you know yeah, I've, yeah. I've you know played in so many cover situations where you know we're playing that kind of stuff and and it's like it's really fun it's just it's just fun to to lay down that groove and keep it as solid as you possibly can well, you it's know, not only that, know. it's I'm, I'm having to mimic all sorts of different parts, like, uh, you know, where, where there's hand claps and where there's, you know, 
uh, timbali parts that were an over, you know, an overdub. I'm having to, to do a lot of things that are, are you know, um, not just straightforward, but the, I mean, the majority of it is a, we're, you know, we're locked in with a click and, and just going um, mm-hmm. and keeping it. A lot of those songs are just four on the floor and all the all the accents are hi hat, you know, and it, like the disco thing was it was a great eye opener for me. I mean, yeah. um, if you ask most drummers to play disco, you know, that you're going to end up with the same, you know, hi hat beat for every disco song. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> Go listen to each one of them. Every one of them has a very specific little little uh, uh, yeah. signature. Like um, I saw, who was it? It wasn't Donna Summer. It was uh, we saw saw somebody on a on a um, on, on a uh, New Year's Eve show at like the you know Times Square where they were doing. Oh, uh, Matt Scurfield just jo- dropped in the uh, chat here. He says Ted exclamation point. <laughs> hey Matt. Yeah. So unfortunately, Ted can't see the chat because we're in a separate uh, separate spot. But Matt's a yeah, Matt's a friend, and uh, I have tremendous respect for that man. He's a uh, he's a killer drummer, man. Yeah, he's and, uh, one of my yeah. favorite tri- Twitch streamers as well. Yeah, he's yeah. a good dude. I like yeah. Matt a lot. Very good. Um, but yeah, we saw. I, I saw. I can't can't remember if it was. It wasn't Donna Summer. It was somebody else. And I'm trying to remember which song it was. But it was the the drummer wasn't playing the hi hat part <laughs> like the original. And I was. It was driving me nuts <laughs> because here I am watching the artist do her own song, and she couldn't get a drummer to do that do the exact part that you know was on the uh, on the song. But anyway, it's a bit of a non sequitur. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, well, you now what, what your question again was, um, related to, um, playing original music versus playing with, it was uh, more of a, just kind of a, a, a relating statement. Like, um, you know, I, I didn't really have a question, uh, directed from that, but it was, it, I was, uh, pretty much just relating that, that I, I feel like I understand that, um, after, cause I've, I've been in that situation as well doing, doing uh you know your, the metal band which is you know your your own pet project where you're writing all the parts and then going into uh you know doing, is freaking out man yeah then it's then going in to care. play some some band that's like okay we want you to you know play it exactly like the recording it yeah. is uh it's quite a bit different you know what's what's cool about um each band situation that i've been in you know um you know we haven't we haven't worried too much about you know whether or not we're going to play it exactly like the mm-hmm. artist. I mean, yes, you have to capture the vibe. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. And um, and I think we do that. And I think that everybody does concentrate hard on learning those parts the way that that they should be played. Yeah. And, uh, but there are little you know how it is, you know, you've done this before a million times too, where, you know, there are little spaces where you can inject some of your own style yeah. and, uh, you know, whether it's a big ending or, you know, you can let loose then, or you can, um, you know, even, even down to like little, little hi-hat hits or, yeah. or, you know, it's funny because um, the more I learn about drumming, in and of itself, um, the more fun it is because there's there's more ways to sort of interpret the music in your own way, you know. Yeah. And I remember hearing um, Todd Zuckerman say um, a while back. Um, he said uh, he said it's fun to be good, you know. Yeah. And it's it's that's not really a, a haughty thing to say or like an egotistical thing to say. It, it's just, it's fun to have the facility to do what you want to do. Yeah. You know, that's why they called it playing music, right? Cause it's, it's fun Yeah. and, and it should always be fun really. Um, and you know, no matter what I'm going through in my life and we all have serious things we go through, uh, when I sit behind the drum set, it's like, it, you know, I'm transported to a completely different place yeah. and me too. Yeah, it's definitely a, the great escape, you know, in a lot yeah. of ways for me, you know, for me to get out of my own head or about something, 
you know, and, uh, you know, and get out of my own way about stuff, yeah. you know? So, uh, Matt says, uh, to tell you, he said hello and he misses hanging out and glad to see you out there rocking all those different gigs and killing it in the studio. Oh man. Well, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I, I follow him constantly too. And, and it's great to see Matt out there, um, just crushing it with his band event. Have you heard those guys? Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. just through Twitch. I've really, my, my entire uh, introduction to it, to Matt has been through Twitch. Um, yeah. So, and, we... you know, the work he did with Gary Hoey was phenomenal. Mm. And, um, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm inspired by Matt a lot, you know, me too. Um, He's inspired in fact, me to he, work on my left when, hand lead. <laughs> you know, we, we talked on the phone, um, before he, well, as he was kind of getting started in this whole, you know, setting up for, uh, what he's doing now. And, um, and he was telling me, Hey, you, you should do this too, you know, kind of a thing. And, That's and I'm I haven't saying. gotten there yet, but I need yeah. to do that. I need to do that. I need to get in there and I need to set myself up for it. Cause I have the equipment. I just haven't, yeah. you know, I, I have I to say, I, I, I can see how, I mean, you're, you've, you've got this kind of regimented idea of, of how you like to operate. And, um, it seems that Matt's stream is, is Matt's stream and my stream are kind of similar in that we we take on a lot of stuff. He, I think Matt um, keeps uh, keeps it within a certain parameter of, of you know stuff that he's mostly familiar with, um, um, and mine's just kind of a free for all. Like people are just throwing whatever at me, and and but either way, it's like okay, this is unrehearsed. We're just gonna have to play this from memory, or sometimes you know he he's got charts for for certain things, um, but uh, <laughs> it's there's there's a very I I had trouble starting doing this because I didn't have anything polished and ready, and I'm thinking, okay, you know if I have even like ten songs polished and ready, how much content is that gonna be? I'm gonna be on for an hour, and then uh, then I'm yeah. out of material for for who knows how long, and and. And again, Carl talked me into it and said, look, just jump in, man. People, people tune in to watch players roughing out ideas on a new fill, trying to figure out, you know, how's this one part played or, or, you know, yeah. th th there could be, you know, just one camera in the corner. It could be a cell phone and the sound quality could be horrible and you'll still have 50 people watching and commenting in the, in the thread you know, the whole time they're going. And I noticed that there were several of my favorite players that were, they were doing live videos on either Facebook or, or Instagram or whatever. And, and I would sit there and watch it. And I wasn't all concerned that they're, you know, that the camera angle was, was not great or the sound wasn't perfect. And so I just started jumping in and, and just kind of, you know, letting it go wherever I wanted to. So I, I could see, you know, if you're if you're really used to approaching things with a with a really regimented and and direct approach, um, it might be a little difficult to let go of that and just go, okay, hey, let's just let this flow and see how it goes. But then yeah, again, you know, that... interestingly enough, you know, um, and yeah, I I felt at the, you know, several years back, I was very 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 regimented in in my approach to everything. You know, it just hey, you know, you know, I. Was, it was funny because uh, Thomas Lang, when I was when I was talking to Thomas, and he he goes, he goes, you know, it's it. I bet you, I bet your garage is incredibly clean. And I was <laughs> like, you're 100 percent right. I mean, you basically get to eat off the floor of my garage. I mean, it's 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 pretty spotless, you yeah. know, for yeah. the most part. Um, and uh, you know, he was he was 100 percent right. He was like, man, just 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 go for it. Just do it. You know, yeah. just do what you got to do. Just be, just do it with reckless abandon, so to speak, you know? And I yeah. thought, you know, that's a good suggestion, you know? Yeah. And so that really helped me a lot, you know, for him to tell me, you know, Hey, just, just go for it and don't worry about anything else. Just, just make it happen. Yeah. You know? It's... And, you know, that was inspirational certainly for me. Doing, doing this is really, uh, uh, really helped me with just letting things go and 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 being a lot more in the moment. It's it's helped my stage presence dramatically as well because 
um, it, it's it, it's become much more relaxed to be, you know, under scrutiny, and and uh, you know just just not worrying about it and just going, huh? We're gonna we're we're gonna do what we do. Um, yeah. And Matt said, yeah, it takes a bit of letting go of the nailing the track mentality. I still struggle a bit with it, but uh, sometimes you just go for it and people dig it. And that's true. And I, I'll, people will give me stuff and I'm like, well, rush is a great example. So, you know, you, you were talking about earlier, um, you know, having to, having to just find little places to put in your own, your own flavor on, on cover stuff. Well, certain stuff, like I, I would say, you know, I play a few Rush songs that I know well enough that I don't feel like I'm just stomping all over his grave to be playing, you know, yeah, but, yeah. but for the most part, it's like when he wrote his parts, that's how they were played. You know, if you saw him live, he was playing those parts exactly the same, you know, he would whereas, change them a little bit here and there. Yeah, like yeah. If you listen from live album or live performance to live performance, there is sure. sometimes he would, you know, played a little bit differently but yeah. he pretty much stuck to the roadmap for the yeah. most part you yeah. know for the big the big fills and stuff like that but there are, there are other bands and other well-known bands that you know they would always change it up like it's mm -hmm. the you know they were just going out there and just going with the flow and it wasn't so you know this part has to be just like that and that part has to be just like that it was you know, and there are a lot of bands that are just, they're going to go out there and it's going to be a different flow every time you hear it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I recently been listening to um, some of the live uh, Porcupine Tree albums, you mm -hmm. know, and, yeah. um, you know, listening to the difference between how Gavin approached things on the studio albums versus how he approached them live. And you could tell that there was definitely a progression um a maturing of you you know if you will of yeah, his yeah. parts yeah because he seems like a very regimented drummer to me too you know seems like it yeah like his his parts are very very clearly defined you know I'm, um but but I'm, when you listen to those live records you know he does change it up a little bit and it's yeah. it's very cool it's very cool to listen to you know i'm only but when you but when you listen to you know on the flip side of that, you know, you listen to, you know, I'm playing in a who band, right? So, mm -hmm. um, well, that's a perfect example right there is, is, uh, yeah. you know, Keith Moon and, was and all I'm, over the place. You know, I just, I just, when I play that gig, I just go for it and I just don't care. You know, I don't care about, yeah. you know, following any well, that kind was of his attitude map as far as <laughs> the drum parts, because, you know, yeah. Moon was such a, manic drummer i mean the guy was just all over the map you know yeah big time all the time like from stem to stern from the beginning of the song yeah. to the end of the song yeah. he was just filling and you know just going crazy the whole time yeah. and and so you know when i first got asked to be in that band um the guitar player called me and he was like hey dude how'd you like to be in this who band you know and i was like i told him straight up you know i go I don't think that's the band for me, man, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but, and he goes, you know what? He goes, why don't you just go back into your, your practice room and approach the songs and play them the way Ted would play them. And I thought, what a concept, yeah. you know? Okay. I'll try that. And so I did, I went back in the practice room and I started just playing them the way I would play them. And, you know, obviously trying to capture the the spirit of Moon yeah, yeah. at the same time, but still playing it the way I would play it. And um, I had a lot more fun, you know, doing that. And yeah. uh, and so here I here I am, what, six or seven months later, I'm still in that band, you know. And it's actually a really fun gig. Yeah, I'm know? sure. So, Man. yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Um, let me see. We have, we have a couple more of my favorite drummers in the chat. I don't know if Benny's still in here, but we have, uh, one, one of the, uh, yeah, one of the, one of my favorite streamers is Benevolent Dick and, and Bum on Stilts who, who, uh, it, it, originally he didn't want to, he didn't want to stream. We did, we did some, some communicating back and forth when, uh, 
you know, before he got started and he wasn't looking at, he wasn't looking to do that at all, but he wanted to get into recording. So we talked a lot about, uh, about equipment and, and, you know, um, you know, shopping for microphones and all that. And, and it turns out he's, he's turned into one of my favorite streamers. Um, he's just killing it over there and just playing what people request. And, and I, I think he would have a great time if you tried this really. Um, yeah, but there is, I, I mean, it, it, it did come down to kind of a, uh, look, just jump in, just jump in and start swimming. You know, that's, that's what it was for me. Yeah. And, and, uh, I've been doing it a l- about a year and a half now. And it's, uh, it's not just therapeutic. It's, it's been helping with, um, with my playing overall, it's, it's benefited my working bands and, and, um, it's really just, it's been good for me all around. I think I think where I would have to maybe figure out how to go there would be, you know, how to work it into my busy playing schedule because yeah, you know, yeah. I'm I'm gigging pretty much you know every week every weekend yeah. and and if I'm not gigging, um, you know, I'm recording drum tracks for people and stuff like that so i mean i just knocked out a drum track just you know two days ago for a guy and uh you know and and that happens a lot you know and so i'm i'm trying to think well how could i jump in and give it justice you know and be consistent well that's a good Uh, that's a good problem to have though that's uh um yeah i mean if you're getting if you're getting work that's i mean pretty much the only time that i'm not streaming is if i'm working with you know either you know a rehearsal or or a gig or a recording uh a recording session and you know yeah of course with the pandemic going i i uh you know that slowed everything down drastically and it's started to pick up again but i mean even during the pandemic i was i was playing churches every week you know i was doing uh every thursday sometimes fridays and you know a couple of uh, services on sundays and mm-hmm. so i was still playing like you know three or four times a week live and then um i was asked to um record um an album for kings and aces which is just this straight ahead rock thing and then i kind of came on as a partner uh, with a guy named Tim and, uh, who's the guitar player. And so we ended up writing an entire album. And so, and now we're working on our second album nice. right now. So, um, you know, even during the pandemic, I was, you know, I was still busy. I still made a full length album and was still gigging every week, which seems crazy, but, but I was, you know, yeah. Which was a good problem to have, you know, I guess, sure. you know, at the time. Well, as long as you stayed healthy, I suppose. Yeah, and it was, well, it, it it's like one of the churches that I play locally is considered an outdoor facility because mm-hmm. they've got this huge roll-up door that they just rolled up every every single time. And the city was like, yep, this is, this is considered an outside kind of a situation. And so... Um, and then every other uh, place I played, you know, it was all about, you know, wearing a mask and, you know, social distancing. Yeah. And uh, some of the places had actually drum shields, you know, where mm-hmm. I was completely shielded from the other members and, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, and I never I never got sick. So no. um, I guess I'm that was a good thing. So. Struggling with all that right now myself because, uh, well, I've I've kind of put everything on hold for the for the time being until the current wave kind of dies down now i did i did i did uh catch it on this one i mean and Mm -hmm. i was you know i was vaccinated in the whole bit too and yeah you know i ended up getting it but it was for me it was like a it was like a a cold you know um and uh but i know that for a lot of other people it's you know much much worse and uh you know, my heart goes out to those folks yeah. for sure. And, um, I've uh, I've had pneumonia a few times in the last uh, decade, and that's you know something I don't want to push again. And um, there's some family health issues going on, so I need to be doing some visits soon. So I just I kind of decided I need to 
you know, take a little break here while, while, uh, you know, while I prepare for that. And, um, you know, I still have this, this outlet, which is great. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it was, it's hard for me to, um, to not take gigs, you know, cause that mm-hmm. is something that brings me just an immense amount of joy uh, mm-hmm. seeing other people, you know, uh, seeing people lose their minds over, you know, what we're doing for, for, you know, for fun and money, but, mm-hmm. you know, something that I've worked, you know, pretty much my whole life to build as a skill now translates to somebody else's cathartic experience. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been, uh, that's been pretty, you know, pretty, pretty important in my life. Um, so understandably, you know, it's, I, yeah. I think it's important to all of us. I mean, who are in this industry, you know, because I mean, by, by the very nature of what we do, you know, there are people there and, um, yeah. and so, you know, I can understand why, you know, bands are not doing the meet and greets and, um, you know, uh, they're being, they're rushing off stage and, you know, hunkering down with their own people yeah. and staying within their own bubble, yeah. you know, I mean, um, it's totally understandable yeah. and it's, it's okay. You know, it's just that we've, you know, we've all had to sort of change the way we do stuff and, and, uh, you know, we just have to have to go with it, you know, as far as yeah. that goes, definitely change yeah. the way we we've been doing things. Indeed. Well, hopefully it gets uh, a little more under control soon. Um, because I would like to get back at it. Um, in the meantime, I'll just keep doing this, and and you know that's where my outlet's at. It does seem Which to is be fantastic. It does seem I to be building. Them. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's insp- Honestly, you're you and Matt and you know Ray and you know everybody else is doing this Twitch thing. I think is uh, it's inspiring me. It really is. Yeah. Cause, uh, he's talking about I, RDG rocks for anybody who's, who's, uh, not sure. Uh, he's, yeah, I, uh, I, yeah. I love what you guys are doing. And, uh, I think it's amazing. You know, you got to kind of, you kind of got to bend with the times, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I hate the thought of, of us as we get older as being these, you know, crotchety old, you know, Luddites, you know, and um and not embracing the things that are changing yeah. because you know if we don't change with them you know we're you know where are we going to be you know yeah. and i i think it's great i I've, I've always embraced the changes you know i've always uh, embraced electronics from an early age you know back in the early yeah. 90s when it was highly uncool yeah. to uh to to have an electronic drum set you know yeah, yeah. and um, you know i had i well, just we... sold my uh my td third my rolling td30 but you know that that's a whole nother subject in and of yeah. itself you know Thank is you. here's <laughs> today's today's electronic drums i mean <laughs> yeah it's like i mean people can't it, I, i've i've had comments on the stream before where they were like you know, the, it took him quite a while to realize that I was playing an electronic kit. Yeah, it but it probably sounds phenomenal online. You this know? thing, uh, yeah. And and you know, the technology is such now that the the sounds are amazing. You know, I mean, yeah. I thought they were really fun back in the early '90s. You know, when I was, you know, I had a I had one of the first, you know, drum cats. Just you know, yeah. which was just this little. Um, you know, square pad basically. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then I ended up buying a trap cat, and yeah. I just I've just continued on with electronics since. You know, well, like with the Roland stuff and and all that. And I know that um, you know with Pet Shark, I incorporated electronics all every single show. Yeah, yeah. So I was definitely doing the hybrid drummer thing, and have been doing it for for many many years and. You know, so I embrace the technology. I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I think if we don't embrace it, um, you know, I, I'm not going to fault somebody who doesn't want to embrace it. Sure. On one hand. But on the other hand, um, I think I think it's a good thing. I really do. And I do embrace it. Well, it's uh, I I'm I love mixing technologies and 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 just 
exploring where the tools can take you. And, and yeah, I think that started for me with, with drummers like Bill Bruford, where, you know, I, I could really see where he was mixing, you know, unorthodox sounds together, you know, oh, totally. even, even before electronics. And then when, when he started in, in inserting electronics into the setup, it was like, he really mm-hmm. wanted to see where you could take it. And, and I saw, you know, him and that just like, like opened everything for me. it turned it in into a cool thing for me whereas you know electronic drums had not been cool before that yeah but. yeah yeah that's true and i think it took a long time for um a lot of drummers to embrace some of the technologies that were coming up yeah. um especially in the 80s you know um it was like this uh you know it, it was like this foreign object to a lot of guys and, and they were just like you know, there's no way I'm going to use something like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, so I don't know. I've always, I don't know. You, you never see guitar players not embracing technologies for the most part. No. You know? yeah. I mean, you know, or keyboard players, you know, because exactly. there's constantly new keyboards, players, keyboards coming out with all these cool new sounds and all these things. Yeah. And I, I feel like it's about time that we drummers, uh, get to experience some of that fun stuff too so there's, at least that's how i feel about there's it. so much and um yeah matt's saying uh and well he's asking number one is pet shark still working together uh we have our last show was i want to say when was that it was october or november and it was with uh jeff tate oh yeah yeah and we did the empire show with Jeff Tate and that was our last show. So, um, right now we're on hiatus, uh, mm-hmm. if I'm being honest. And, um, you know, we're still trying to figure out where it's going to go. And, um, uh, one of the big things is that, um, our guitar player is leaving the state. And, yeah. and so, having to negotiate that will be a major challenge. Sure. Um, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but I'm continuing to write and, um, so I don't know, I don't really know what's, uh, around the corner for pet shark per se, but mm-hmm. I can tell you that I'm, I'm, fully I'm still in writing mode and I'm still coming up with all kinds of ideas and um you know I want to continue in that vein because I yeah. I mean us musicians I mean by our very nature we are uh, creative beings and I just can't stop that creative process you know um and so whatever happens in the future i i don't know i don't know what's again i i'm really on the fence i really don't know what the future is for pet shark yeah. um, but i can say that you know we haven't gigged in the last couple of months and uh, and we haven't done any writing since the last album i mean we did a little bit but we didn't finish anything yeah. and so um we're kind of at an impasse right now um, to be honest. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean, I'm hopeful for the future, but I, I'm going to continue to write. I'm going to continue to record and put, put new music out. I can tell you that much That's regardless. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Matt also said there's, there's openness to all music styles and performance on Twitch. And that's great for, for different types of players. And that, that I was going to mention to you, you might, um, you know, if you find the time, just browse around, you know, take a look at, at the, uh, the, the different styles of streamers on here. Um, the, the music streamers on the, cha- on, on the site are it, it really everybody's got their own kind of station DNA, you know, like everybody's got a very unique approach. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that I enjoy about it is, is looking at everybody, everybody's different styles, um, their, their visual appearance and, and, you know, just the way they run their stream or, you know, it could be something very regimented or, or extremely loose, like what I've got or, 
Um, there, there's just a, a ton of room for, for doing it however you want to do it. So that, that was part of the appeal to me as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, that's appealing to me too. I think that's, that's really cool. You know, that you're able to have that you. outlet. Yeah. And, uh, and again, I, I applaud you guys for jumping in with both feet. I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. It's, I'm running a, a, a very low budget television show out of my house. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. And I'm, you know, looking at the setup that Matt has too. And yeah, I'm just going, wow, that's really cool. You know? Yeah. And he's about to upgrade his setup. He's, he's working on a whole new room. So I'm, I'm excited to see what, uh, what he comes up with there. It's yeah. I saw, I saw his, I saw him post some pictures of the, the new room and yeah, I'm kind of excited to see what he, he does with it as well. Yeah. And I mean, his last setup was really cool too. So, I mean, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah. but I do have, you know, I've got a space, uh, I've got my, my studio and, um, you know, I have the facility and, and I've got most of the equipment. I think I would just have to add a few pieces and yeah. put the whole thing together. I would certainly look to you and Matt for, for I'd guidance. Be as happy far as to I help goes. you with that. Um, I, my biggest, uh, well, I guess I, I would, I, I wish that I had enough space to have you know all of my setup set up <laughs> so i mean i've got i've got uh you know a, an acoustic well i've got several acoustic kits but it would be really nice to be able to have you know like a, a acoustic setup over here and and you know the the electronic over here and percussion setup over there and the keyboard station over there and you know um but uh you know gotta make the best of what you got <laughs> i've got a very small space here compared to where where we were before but uh it's it's functional it's a lot of fun it looks pretty good it's it's working yeah, yeah. it is it is a bit of a pit i yeah. think it's cool um and matt also said he's looking into he's debating on adding a trigger surface like the spd sx or the alesis strike he's not cool. sure which yet i'm kind of on the fence about that too because i've, I've had a few I've seen a lot of uh, chatter online about the Elisa stuff just not being very substantially built. Which yeah, is nice. I've I've read some reviews on the the Elisis and I actually have a, another drummer buddy, um, Kevin Aiello, who has that mm -hmm. that unit, and he he hasn't had any problems with it at all, yeah. and uh, said it works just fine. And um, I've been uh, using the Roland stuff for many many years. I yeah yeah. I've actually got two Roland SPSX units, and um, and you know they've just been diehards, man. They just they yeah, just yeah. always they've always worked for me. Yeah. And well, they're expensive, so got, but it's you know that's why. I mean, you're getting build quality out of it. It's it's something that you're going to be smacking for for years and years. It's you, you yeah. Want, that's that's not the thing to skimp on, for sure. And so. And yes, the the rolling unit is a you know it's a couple hundred bucks more, um, but you know you kind of get what it's the old saying you know you get what you pay for yeah. and and so I've chosen to to stick with Roland. Um, I thought about switching, but um, I've decided to stick with the Roland stuff only because it's pretty tried and true. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean. It's extremely um, versatile too. It's not like you know. I, I I don't feel like you're limiting yourself by using their sample pads as as opposed to to uh, anybody else. Exactly. I mean, you can load your own stuff in there, your own samples. You can buy sample packs. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. And yeah. um, you know, it's it's pretty limitless. So um, I think that. I don't think you're going to go wrong with either the Alesis or the Roland, but yeah. Uh, but for now, I'm sticking with Roland, yeah, personally. Yeah. Plus, I mean, it, there's I, I see people all the time. I had this this talk with an old friend that we were seeing. You know, I had the same laptop computer for. I mean, I, I this uh, this MacBook Pro I've had for uh, since 2012, and the one that I had before that I had since 2008. And the, the one that I had since 2008 still works. It's just not, you know, it, it's just not supported anymore, the hardware on it. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, you've got people that treat their stuff, you know, set it down carefully and, and, 
put it in the bag and and in the uh, in the case or you know take care of everything and wrap their cords just right you know and then you've got other people that are like walk into the room throw this down wrap up your cable like this you know yeah yeah (laughs) there's a reason why you know you can i I feel like uh, the elisa's thing even if it's you know if if people are complaining about the build quality i bet i could still get a lot of time out of it just because i'm one of those careful guys that's always no set that down carefully and no that's not how you wrap a cable this is i mean i still have radio shack cables that are 20 years old Mm -hmm. that were budget cables i recently just changed out all my studio cables i uh oh my god i actually um tapped into uh my drummer friend uh you probably know him dennis leaflang uh Um, i know the name um, plays, you know, played with, uh, Bumblefoot and, okay, um, yeah, yeah. Lita Ford and, oh, wow. you know, a nice. lot of, a lot of big players. Yeah. I mean, he's a great drummer and he, he's, uh, kind of an electronics whiz. I mean, the guy has, he's taught me a lot of stuff and, you know, um, he actually taught me how to build my own cables. And oh, so yeah. I bought all of the raw materials and, you know, assembled and soldered all my own cable, my studio cables. And so I literally just changed out recently uh, my entire um, setup of cables because my cables were like, you know, 20 years old and yeah, they were tired, you know. <laughs> so it, it would be nice to have custom links for specific things because I have, I have so many aspects of, I mean, if you could see the behind of, of this setup, it is just, you know, there, there are cables going everywhere and I'm, I'm just about to where I'm going to take this whole thing apart and redo it and move everything again. This is, you know, in the, uh, in the first like six months that I was here, I, I changed the entire setup like seven times because it was, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it was such a smaller place. I had to keep changing things around to figure out what's going to work. And yeah. Um, but now, so I've got a relatively comfortable setup, but every time I make a little change, it's not like you, <laughs> I don't end up taking all the cables out and then putting them all back down to adjust for that one little change. You end up doing that one little cable. And then before you know it, you've done 20 changes to your setup. And those 20 changes equal about 40 or 50, you know, spots yeah. on the, on the setup where it's like, ah, that's now a mess. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. What a pain. But you know, onward and upward, man. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, a little bit at a time and you'll get there. Every, you know? every time I take the setup apart and put it back together, something improves dramatically. So that's, right. that's the one thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, what's the next action before I actually execute. And then there's a plan and it's like a whole day that I have to do that. But after that, it's like, wow, now it can do this. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, I love that. Yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's talk about some of your some of your influences. Who are who are your biggest influences? Your favorite players, or you know, what what was the first what was the first time that you you can re- recall being super excited about drumming? Just I mean, either seeing somebody else do it or hearing it, or you know, you what know, was... for me, uh, it was Ringo, honestly, with the Beatles um, from an early age because. You know, I'm I'm one of nine kids, wow. and in my family, and uh, I'm the seventh. Actually, I have yeah. three three brothers and five sisters, and um, so naturally, I'm one of the youngest in yeah. the family, and so I was really influenced by the music that they were listening to at the time, like growing up in the '60s and the '70s, and um. And so the Beatles was a huge, huge influence on me. I mean, I think the first Beatles song I ever heard was uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, you know. Yeah. And then I can remember getting up on the uh, coffee table with some of my brothers and sisters and, you know, acting like we were the Beatles, you know, acting like we were we were the band, you know. Yeah. And, um, and then, but even prior to that, uh, gosh, I mean, my dad loved uh jazz and he loved uh, like herb albert and tijuana brass mm-hmm. and so that was always playing wherever he was home and um and then 
I was listening to The Doors back then. I was listening to Cream back then. Mm -hmm. And I remember um, when I was a, a young kid and actually seeing Cream for the first time on television. And um, I watched Ginger Baker play, you know, one of his solos. And I was really intrigued by that, you know. And then um, it just kind of kept blossoming from there. I mean, I, I really got heavy into Genesis and Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was something about progressive music that really spoke to my soul, you know. Yeah. I mean, it just really, yeah, I started out basic with, uh, with the Beatles and, and even the, the doors had some complex stuff. Um, and my brothers would listen to the who and, um, Simon Garfunkel and my sisters would listen to like, uh, you know, Carly Simon and, yeah. you know, more folksy kind of music, you know, I sure. got into, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young and Crosby, Stills and Nash and, you know, that kind of stuff. And so there was really a lot of music that was thrown at me um, from a very early age. But the music that really, again, that really spoke to me big time was progressive rock music, yeah. you know, I like the Yes Fragile record, man. Um, I can remember, you know, I had this giant boom box um, back then that it was a, it was a, a tape player and I strapped that sucker to the, to my Stingray bicycle yeah. and I just blasted, you know, the fragile album throughout the neighborhood as I'm riding down the streets, yeah. you know, I figured if I liked it that much, everybody else should like it too, you know, kind of a thing. So, you know, um, so I really got into yes. And I really got into Led Zeppelin yeah. and, um, I just loved John Bonham, man. The first time I heard yeah. Led Zeppelin, I think it was Led Zeppelin one actually, um, when they were getting some radio play and I just heard them on the radio and I was like, Oh my gosh, who are these guys? You know? And, um, and this drummer, holy cow, you know? Yeah. And so, I mean, I bought every Led Zeppelin album, you know, thereafter. And, you know, I was into Credence. I was into just all these different bands, you know, my brother was into Kiss. So I was getting, uh, you know, I was listening to Kiss every morning <laughs> when he would wake up, he would blast the Kiss in the yeah. bedroom next to mine. And um, so, yeah, man, it was just like, it was just a bombardment of, of everything from the Beatles to Led Zeppelin to Genesis to Yes to Kansas to um, so many different bands, you know, that my brothers and sisters were listening to at the time. It was just Pink Floyd, you know? Yeah, yeah. I can remember, uh, you know, just really digesting the, the Pink Floyd catalog. We, uh, um, the other night we then. did, we did What's uh, that? Sunday night, uh, we, I did this for my mom because she's a huge Pink Floyd fan as, as I am as well. Um, but, uh, she didn't, she hasn't been able to tune in that often. And I, I told her Sunday during the day, I said, okay, if you tune in today, I'm going to play just for you, you know? And, and, uh, she tuned in and we ended up doing, I did five and a quarter hours of Pink Floyd the other night. Just, Jeez. just did. We, we wow. started with metal, uh, or I'm sorry, I started with animals, uh, then went to metal, then wish you were here, uh, then the wall and then dark side of the moon. We finished the, the night with, uh, uh, Adam Hart mother, but not, not the whole album, just, just the track Adam Hart mother. And, uh, that's it was, crazy about the, the animals record when that came out oh man and i would put on the headphones and i would i would literally go to sleep at night listening to that the, the animals record yeah, you know yeah uh almost every night and, and you know um and then my brother my older brother brought home a super trap album you know crime mm -hmm. of the century yeah and man i just loved super trap and i don't, um, I don't know I don't think I know that album. Of course, I know Breakfast in America. Um, yeah, yeah, that was a really huge album for yeah, them. And then, yeah. but then I started getting into Weather Report and mm. um, Mahavishnu Orchestra oh, yeah. and John Luke Ponty. You know, um, you know, Steve Smith. Smith played on you know 
some of the John Luke Ponty stuff. And that's kind of what turned me on to Steve Smith yeah. and his drumming. Yeah. And um, I actually saw John Luke Ponty live. Um, Steve Smith was not drumming with him at the time, but, um, and then I, you know, obviously got into Rush and, yeah. you know, I mean, I've probably been to 30 or 40 Rush concerts oh, in man. my lifetime. You know? I only got to see him one time and that, you know, uh, uh, hearing YYZ the first time when I was 11 years old was when I knew I wanted to be a drummer, even though I had no idea what he was doing. I just, I, mm -hmm. I heard what he was doing and I was like, I want to do that. That's, that's mm -hmm. what I want to be. But I only got to see him one time and it was on, um, now I can't even remember if it was the, if it was the counterparts tour or the roll of bones, but it was at, at uh, in San Diego uh, at the uh, sports arena down there, which is a terrible echo chamber. Yeah. One of the loudest shows I've ever been to. Um, I went all the way to the opposite end of the auditorium there, and I swear they were so loud it felt like it was blowing my hair back. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the first time I saw Rush was uh, at the Forum, and they were opening for Ted Nugent. Oh, my God. And um, I was just, I was so blown away. It was the 2112. Wow. When the 2112 album yeah. came out, that was my first introduction to Rush. Wow. And I was just like, I was so blown away by that band that I just like, I could have took her lit, you know, left. I mean, the Ted Nugent show was, was fun and all. Sure. But the highlight for me was the Rush, yeah. was Rush opening, honestly. Yeah. And, you know, I got to see Journey. Uh, the first tour that they went out with Steve Perry back then. And, wow. you know, Ainsley Dunbar, I think, was drumming at the time. Yeah, he's, he's And then awesome. shortly after that, Steve Smith came on board. And, um, you know, so I would say, you know, a lot of those guys influenced my playing, you know. Um, yeah. Everything from Led Zeppelin, I mean, I, I learned so much of the Led Zeppelin catalog on drums at the time. Um, and I, I would have to say Phil Collins was a, was definitely a drumming influence because course, I learned, yeah. you know, I would play along to the Genesis stuff, you know, um, and that stuff was, um, you know, super complex for me at the time because yeah. I was such a young player, you know, I was like, how in the world could I learn this stuff? But I would just listen to it over and over and yeah. over and over yeah. again and you know pretty soon i found that i could i could play some of the parts you know not yeah. all of them yeah um and even with rush you know i was playing along with the rush albums and um you know i obviously couldn't execute it at the time like like neil could but um but i was trying you know yeah and i would say that that was certainly my earliest influences i would say were, were those kinds of bands, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and it's kind of interesting, you know, you look at the progression of some of those, some of those drummers from the day, you know, like Steve Smith, for instance, you know, when he was, when he went from playing with John Luponti to then playing, you know, with Journey, um, and then coming up with some really iconic yeah. drum parts for, for Journey, yeah. you yeah. know, I mean, even to this day, you know, at the time, you know, I remember he was uh, like the song Don't Stop Believing, you know, mm -hmm. he's playing, he's playing it open handed, you know, yeah. and, um, and I think because he was experimenting with open hand playing, Matt can relate because Matt is an open handed player, yeah. he's such a great open handed player. And, um, and I only, you know, I dip my toes in the water of open handed playing, you know, writing with my left hand yeah, versus yeah my right um but i'm i'm nowhere near as confident as matt is doing no uh, me either i uh i started uh, experimenting with it a lot more playing in the dance band because there's so many straightforward songs i'm thinking okay this is a great great opportunity to work on the left hand and and yeah. kind of separate this 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 invisible link that i've had between my right leg and my and my right hand for for yeah. you know the last 35 years and i started really doing that um, a lot more with the dance band and then I got into Twitch and, and found Matt and started watching him and the more I watched him do it I'm like oh, okay I really want to work on this now 
Yeah, and so and it's I, really fun. I work it's it in fun a lot. It's fun to yeah. play open hand, and then there's a certain comfort that comes with it because, like for instance, like this this little stack behind me, you know, you know so I added um, I added a remote hat um, mm -hmm. to my my home setup, you know, many many years ago, and yeah. it's really fun to to switch back and forth between, you know, playing left handed hi hat to yeah yeah you know, playing the remote hat and, um, you know, and I've, I've kind of dabbled, you know, in making drums too. So, um, I've actually added, um, some pieces to my kit that I, I've, I've made as well. Um, in addition to my kit, you know, yeah, I mean, you've probably I, seen some of the videos I put out about I did. drum making and stuff, you know, specifically the, the, uh, gong bass that you've got going on. We can see it a little bit there. <laughs> yeah. There. You yeah. can kind of see it right there in the background yeah. it's right there yeah, yeah and yeah it's a it's kind of sitting off the kit for now right now because i was yeah. recording that tune the other day and i just didn't need it so i i set it aside but um but that's a really fun um thing to play with too oh yeah um, yeah you've uh, got you've got a pearl, pearl reference play. kit is that what you've what you've got there the, What's that? Uh, is it the Pearl Reference that you've got, or yeah, this is uh this is my Pearl Reference kit, right here, and um, here let me show you. All right, kind of move things around a little bit here. Those okay, so they... I added I I made this this eight inch tom. So I bought the shell from Keller, wow. and um, and I did finish myself, and it I mean it, you know you can't even tell. You know, Dennis Lee Flank came over and we did kind of a little drum hang. Yeah. Uh, recently, and he was like, "Man, he goes, you, he's like, you can't even tell that nice. it's not a Pearl reference drum." Yeah. Um, but it it works so well with the kit, and I just felt like it was just the kit was a little, you know, off kilter because I I I always wanted an eight inch tom, yeah. you know, right here, something a little bit higher, and so we got eight, ten, twelve. 14 16 and then i've got the uh the 22 inch gong drum right yeah. or pan gong drum yeah right there so yeah nice. and then a, a whole array of snare drums in the background yeah you know, that i can choose from uh, for whatever tunes i'm recording which is which is beneficial it's uh, it's good to have a selection of snares i'm i'm up to 11 at this point um, you and me both. I think I think I'm, <laughs> I think I'm up to eleven right now as well. I remember you know? I had the same just pearl export, um, you know, six inch uh, for for the longest time. I, I think I, I that was the only snare I had for for like twenty five years. And then I was at uh, San Diego Drum and Percussion one day, and they had there was a, a green snare. It looked like a premiere, but there was no badge on it, and. Um, they had it for fifty dollars. It had been they had it originally for one hundred and fifty. Then they slashed that to seventy five, and then they slashed that to fifty. And I'm like, all right, I want I'm taking this thing home. <laughs> and yeah. and uh, it's uh, and so so then I had two snares. And then at that point, my wife is like, what do you need more than one snare drum for? And I'm like, well, they're different. They're not the you know, it's like the the heart of the kit. Pretty yeah, much it's the, the voice, know, the, it's the voice the of the kick drum and set the really snare you know, are, you know, they all sound different. And I, yeah. you know, difference was with some guys, you know, they just collect them and I actually play them all, you know, yeah. I rotate them onto my, on and off of my kit, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, just to give them a little bit of playing time. And, and it, it's nice to get to know those snare drums too, for, you know, if somebody sends you a song, you can say, Oh, okay. I'm going to use my uh, Dunnett snare on this yeah. one, or I'm going to use uh an SLP or a Yamaha snare on this, you know, or, yeah. you know, and, um, or even a black beauty, you know, the old stalwart, you know, classic rock drum. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I've also got a, um, you know, a, uh, uh, a nickel plated, um, uh, pearl drum as well, metal drum that also sounds very similar to a black beauty, but it's got definitely a different voice. Nice. And then I've got actually, uh, I bought a drum from Dennis Lee Flang, which was, um, um, actually a part of the, uh, um, um, twisted sisters drummer. 
Oh, wow. Used that on, my, on the like 1980, I think 80, 80 or 81 tour. Wow. And um, he is no longer with us. He's yeah, uh, yeah. deceased, but yeah. that drummer, that particular drummer, but that was his drum. It's a, it's a bronze uh, snare drum, Ludwig. So nice. uh, yeah, it's, um, it's kind of fun, man, to, uh, you know, as you start purchasing, um, snare drums um and I, i've actually made a couple of them too actually this the one i'm sitting right next to right here is actually one of my creations um so this little guy right here you can see it i don't know it's good this guy right here there it's a little go. soprano it's a little right. 12 inch soprano snare yeah so I made that back in the uh, the early '90s. I I actually made a couple of full drum sets, and um, because I couldn't at the time, I just couldn't afford to. I really wanted a DW drum set back yeah. then, you know. Yeah. Because it was like, oh, everybody's you know, all the great players are playing DW, you know, yeah. at the time, and um, and so. Mark Morales, my drum teacher, actually goes, why don't you just, why don't you try making, you know, a nice drum set, you know? And that's when I kind of thought, you know, that's a good idea, you know? So uh, we ordered the shells together and all the hardware. And um, a friend of mine who was an auto painter at the time, um, he's the one that shot the shells, you know, in black lacquer. And nice. So I made a, I made a full, um, black lacquer drum set and then i i made a full white drum set and so um and another firefighter buddy actually still has that drum set the white drum set he bought yeah. that set and um and my son now has that black lacquer kit oh, that nice. i made way back when oh that's so, awesome and then when i saw this this pearl reference kit when this uh kit came out um i always wanted one you know and because yeah. i just love the whole wood combinations thing yeah yeah and um and i just sort of settled on pearl and so i've been playing pearl now for for years and years and i even put pearl hardware on um on the kit that i made that my son has mm -hmm. and um you know you were talking about you know just seeing drums or whatever and wanting them so i saw this this Pearl reference kit at a, uh, a guitar center in Fountain Valley. And it was sitting way up high on the shelf, you know, and it was up there for, it had to be up there for a year, you know, nobody bought it. And, um, I kept I coming by, you know, to get sticks or get whatever yeah. at the time. And I was like, um, you know, I just kept eyeballing that drum set. And I kept yeah. thinking that I want that drum set. And so finally I, I saved enough money at the time to, uh, to purchase the kit. And, um, I think it was a, and I, since it was a, let's see, it was a 22 by 18 inch kick mm -hmm. and it was a 20 or 12 by nine rack Tom and a 10 by eight rack. And then it had a 16 inch floor Tom. So I've since added a 14 inch um, in the same configuration. And then I added the eight inch when I, mm -hmm. when I built the eight inch yeah. drum. So it's now a seven piece drum set, you know? So it nice. went from a five piece to a seven piece. And when they first... Actually, no, an, I'm sorry, an eight piece, piece if you include the, uh, the, the, the pan gong drum. Yeah. When they but, uh, first but came... This is my, this is just my this is my studio kit this is this kit just remains here in my studio uh, all the time and it's always set up it's always mic'd up and yeah. ready to go whenever i get drum tracks i just you know hit the record button tune it up make sure it's tuned and yeah you know record with this kit and then i've got um two other kits that i use um one is a classic pearl maple kit and then the other is a um a pearl masters kit that i use that i play out with all the time nice and the reason i went with that is because you know as i've got older you know my back just 
couldn't take the weight of the Pearl reference kit, man, because this thing is, it's a heavy drum set. Yeah. And so yeah. that's why I just leave it at the house now. I leave it in my studio yeah. and, um, and just tote the Pearl masters around because they're thinner shells and it's a much lighter kit to tote around. Yeah. So, so it saves my back a little bit. If you sure. Will. Sure. Yeah. I've, I've seen your hardware bag. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Brutal. Yeah. 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 Back when I was tooting this, toting this, uh, this reference kit around, man, it was, it was heavy and I was just yeah, like, yeah. Oh my God, you know, I need some help. You know? yeah. yeah. We don't and really get that. <laughs> so I've since cut down the, yeah, I know that some drummers are, are, are probably cringing right now, but, uh, um, I've since cut down the 22 by 18 to a 22 by 14 because I found that, you know, recording with a 14 to a 16 inch, mm -hmm. um, depth on the kick drum is, is just more desirable. Yeah. You know? yeah. And so that's why I cut it down and, uh, you know, I've got the tools and I've made lots of drums. Yeah. And so I just thought, you know, I'm just going to cut it down. And then I redid all of the bearing edges on my entire kit mm -hmm. myself. So I just rerouted all of them. Nice. Because upon further examination of this drum set, um, my bearing edges were not flat. Yeah. And so I re-sanded them and I recut all of them save for the 10 inch the 10 inch was fine yeah but every other one i recut uh, uh, real quick about the uh, about the kick depth um there's a there's a youtube channel i don't know if you've if you've seen it or not called sounds like a drum um and it's uh, uh it's some new york players that have just gone really extensively into just about every aspect of tuning and materials and sizes and and um hardware and uh they they just they'll pick a subject and just go to the nth degree in examining you know the differences in it you know everything from spring tension on your pedal to you know what kind of heads to use on you know for snares for certain effects and different tuning techniques and um I'm I'm pretty sure it was on that site that I saw they did a breakdown of, you know, the results on different kick depths because, you know, of course you're seeing in the eighties it got kind of out of out of hand with people, you know, putting these cannons together where you got, you know, the uh, the you know, you got a twenty inch kick with a you know, that's twenty inches deep and, and they really found that with there there's so much air to move in there that it really there makes it, it difficult for you to get a, a nice, uh, concise controlled punch out of mm -hmm. out of something when you've got this this cannon kind of thing going on um versus yeah. you know 14 um and they they kind of decided that 14 is kind of the magic number for kick drums as far as the depth so um yep and i i agree with that wholeheartedly you know i've <clears> done uh so much of my own home you know studio recordings mm -hmm. um using you know various size kick drums that I, I feel like the, the golden, really the golden area is 14 to 16. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I ended up cutting mine down to a 14. Yeah. It just, and it was a world of difference, man. Uh, once I mic'd it up and started recording with the 14 versus the 18, mm -hmm. it was a, it was a massive difference in, in my kick sound. Yeah. It's just so much punchier and just so much easier to control, you yeah. know, that's a hard yeah. thing about picking drums when you're not an experienced player or if you didn't have the guidance of somebody to look to or, or a channel on mm -hmm. YouTube to go reference um, is, you know, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of kids out there that want a custom drum set, but they have no <laughs> idea, you know, they're, they're looking at it cause they, they want to look, you know, they want a specific look, but they don't know what the, what the sounds are they're trying to get, or they, they think they know. And, and they don't <laughs> like mm -hmm. you know, something like that, that extra deep kick would be a great example of that. Or, or, you know, mm -hmm. not knowing what, yeah. what materials to pick or, um, there's, there's so many things. And now we have all these resources. It's really amazing. Absolutely. Um, there's so many different configurations that you can, 
either order or just buy off the shelf now. Yeah. You know, that it does, it is helpful to know um, what kind of sounds you're going to get out of a certain size drum. And, um, and, and that really kind of is an experiential thing, yeah. you know, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I've been um, operating uh, my own studio for, you know, the better part of, gosh, probably now 25 to 30 years worth. Mm -hmm. And, and there is, there is a big difference between um, certain size shells, certain head configurations. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, are you using a single ply head? Are you using a double ply head? Is it a coated head? You know, and it's all kind of a personal preference thing, you know? Yeah, it really is. So, yeah, but you got to know what each sound is so that you know, you can say, okay, well, this is my sound you know, yeah. or this is a sound I'm going for. Yeah. And, you know, so tap into those guys who, who really know what they're talking about when it comes to, um, head combinations, what kind of heads you're using. Yeah. Um, I am a, an Aquarian endorser. And so I, I exclusively use Aquarian drum heads and, um, and it's just, you know, I've tried them all. I've tried the Evans, I've tried Remos, I've tried them all. And um, even before I was assigned Aquarian artist, um, you know, I was using I was using a bunch of them. But I, yeah, I yeah. settled into the Aquarian heads. I just liked that sound, and that just became my sound. And I was using Aquarian heads for about 20 years before I actually signed a contract with them. So I was one of those guys that didn't jump ship and go to some other company. I actually signed with the company that, that I knew and loved yeah. already. And that's also kind of an important thing to think about too. You know, I mean, we haven't really even talked about endorsements and that sort of thing, Yeah. but um, you know, but that's a whole nother subject in and of itself and maybe, well, it is that that's important for, you know, there's a lot of musicians out there that think um, they're looking for somebody to validate them by giving them an endorsement deal. And that's not that's that's the opposite of what, you know, what what the uh, you know, what the idea is. I mean, the idea is you pick something, you know, that, like, I mean, with with you, with the with Aquarian heads, I do love Aquarian heads also, but I've been primarily I mean, I've just always played Remo. But mm -hmm. I have been known to use a super kick too, you know, here and there. Yeah, because they're just, they're just fabulous. Man. And, um, yeah. you know, if. Yeah, so many benefits to it, for sure. Um, so, um, but if you pick. And, yeah, and, and, you know, let's set the record straight too about endorsements for a second. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, I'm endorsed by. Yeah, that's backwards. <laughs> That's backwards thinking, man. Yeah, no, yeah. the artist is the one who endorses a product. Yeah. So you have to say it like, no, I endorse, yeah, you yeah. know, Los not Cobbles drum sticks. So I endorse Aquarian yeah. drum head. It's not the other way around. Yeah, and, exactly. And work has to be done um, on your part uh, as an artist in order for you to in order for that to happen, in order for you to actually sign a contract yeah, yeah. with a company yeah, and choose to work with that company. Of course. So there's a few things that need to fall in place before that happens. And it's funny because, you know, it seems to be um, kind of the goal of a lot of players, you know, oh, I need endorsements, you know. Well, it's there. It's a give and take, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got to make sure that you're, one, you're endorsing a company that you love, and one that you actually play and yep. um because invariably i constantly i'm always getting asked you know what kind of drum heads do you use you know why do you use these heads you know what's so good about them you know so you really do have to know the product too because you're out there pushing the brand you know yeah yeah and uh and that's so it's that's yeah. the value that well, you're bringing to them as well as you're, you know, you're giving the real world, real world experience, um, you know, a, a um, 
you're giving that story to the to the people that they're that they're looking to sell heads to as well. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's really what what it comes down to. But yeah, it's I can understand because I was once like that myself, thinking you know, well, if I could just get some endorsement deals, it's well, you know, equipment's expensive. It's <laughs> it's uh you know, look at the uh, you know, well, really any of it, symbols or heads or you know, sticks or or you know, microphones. I wanted to talk about whatever microphones you're using as well. Like I use, well, okay, let, uh, let's get into the microphones then for a second. I'm using, um, I'm using Earthworks in my studio. Mm-hmm. Um, I was using like uh, Sennheiser E604s was my last set of um, like Tom mics, for instance. And, um, and I went to them after the audits. I was I actually used um the Audix series of microphones mm-hmm. on my first on the first Pet Shark record. Um but on the last Pet Shark record I I used all Earthworks mics um both overheads and uh on my toms my and, but I did still use a um AKG D112 and I'm now using an SE uh like Sam Edward Mm-hmm. Um, kick mic. It's a cheaper kick mic, but uh, and actually Dennis Lee Flang turned me on to that microphone. Interesting. Um, Got to give credit where credit's due, right? So um, he was telling me about it, and I heard some examples of uh, what it's what it was doing, and so I ended up going out and just buying one. And well, it looks like a nice so, mic. So I triple mic my both my snare and my kick. So I use a um, uh, a Bayer Dynamics uh, M201 microphone on my snare, and I also use a um, uh, an Earthworks SR20 LS on top. And then on the bottom, I might switch it up between like right now I've got an Audix i5, yeah, which is yeah. kind of designed to compete with a uh, yeah, yeah. a Shure SM57. I've got one of those and as well. So I've been traveling a lot, you know, with uh, with this Queen band, and so I've been using the uh, the Shure SM57 a lot mm-hmm. with that band, and I've been using my um, uh, my Sennheiser E604s for my my touring kit. Yeah, yeah. And those are just kind of bomb proof. Yeah, yeah. You know, e- easy to slap on mics, and they always sound really good. Yeah. So, and then I have um, internal kick drum microphones in in two of my kits and um i use an audix d6 in my touring kit and i've got an akg and the se kick mic in inside my um pearl reference kit and then i also use a uh, yamaha sub kick on the outside very good of that. what's your uh, interface what are you what are you using to record with i use a um a claret air eight pre um and from focus right mm-hmm. and then i have daisy chain that with a um a scarlet 18 i 20. so i have 16 channels of recordability um at any given time and i also have um mic pre's in my studio so i've got like the um um the uh 573s and um and what are the other ones i have so i've got six six external mic trees that i use on my kit and um so i use one set for overheads i use uh the other set on my snare drum and the other set on my kick drum mm-hmm. and the my the uh the toms i just go into all clean channels so um the focus right stuff is all incredibly clean mic pre's and so i just go super clean with all of my toms yeah. um, and like i said external mic pre's with my snare overheads and kick drum nice and what daw are you using i'm uh i'm working in logic okay so i started out with like i mean early early on you know like uh, like late '90s, maybe around 2000 or so, was, there was a program called um, 
I think it was Guitar Tracks Pro. Yeah. And um, and I was operating with a PC at the time. And so this is like ancient technology now. But <laughs> um, and then I uh, I did a jazz rock record with a band called um, Six Thirty Jam um, in about the mid two thousands and. Um, I ended up recording that in in my own studio as well, and I wanted to upgrade my upgrade my DAW, and so the keyboard player who sent me the tracks for for that album um, was using uh, Digital per- Performer. Yeah, yeah. You know the Mo Two stuff. Yeah, I've used that before. And um, so he was like, "Oh, you got to get di- Digital Performer, you know, DP," and so and so he's the one who kind of ran me through my paces and taught me how to use digital performer. Yeah. And then, um, and then I switched my entire system over to Apple, you know, to a Mac Mm -hmm. and, um, and because logic works so seamlessly with Mac, um, I just, I just went with logic and I, I, it was a, quite a learning curve to switch from knowing digital performer really well yeah which is what i i did the whole first pet shark record i recorded it in digital performer um and you know mixed it and uh in digital performer and then shortly after that first pet shark record i switched over to um logic and i just haven't looked back you know yeah because it just you know i know logic really well now i mean we're 10 years later now so yeah you know i'm 10 years into working with logic and i'm just so used to it now and it's just every bit as intuitive as pro tools or digital performer so yeah well, i, I kind uh, of feel like it it's a, a factor of of just whatever you're most comfortable with because you know when you boil it boil it down the all of the daws work pretty well the same they're just different workflows you know yeah and, and of course so. they'll come with different plugins and 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 all that um because I've, I've you know i got started with pro tools and um you know then ended up getting uh, uh through a friend of mine he started me up with uh, with nuendo and then from nuendo i started playing around with cubase and then <laughs> and then i worked with with digital performer and with logic and and um and then for a while i was using presonus because you know computers die or they get old and and things don't get supported anymore and before you know it you're like all right do i spend you know the money to buy the latest version of this recorder when i'm going to have to upgrade the computer later anyway and then yeah so I'm I'm kind of thinking about um, you know I I use a lot of Apple stuff so I'm thinking maybe the next my next iteration is going to be Logic Pro because it's I you know I know so many people that are using it and and I'm using several Apple devices so you know the <laughs> cross compatibility issues are are you know are of concern and yeah. um you know and and I know it works because. It's, uh, you know, so many people are using it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's all about what you know, you know I mean? Yeah. Everything out there is designed to compete with each other, right? Yeah. So they're all, you know, every upgrade is, you know, everything has gotten so good yeah. that it doesn't matter if you're using, you know, Innuendo or if you're using Cubase or if you're using, yeah. you know, Logic or DP um, or Pro Tools, you know, they all... Yeah they all work and yeah. they all work really well now you know it's not like it was back in the early 2000s you know where stuff was just sort of blossoming yeah um i mean they've all they're all really good at this point you know what so I, it's just just a matter of what you know well really yeah i um i still to this day kind of get butterflies in my stomach when i think back to um, when I was a kid, just picking up drums and, you know, no recording experience, no recording equipment, no nothing. And all of that seemed unobtainable. Like, at, you yeah. know, it's, I was in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming listening to all these albums and thinking, you know, that was just a world away. I wonder if I'll ever be able to be in like a do a recording session in a real studio and, and 
you know, as, as, you know, moving to California and then, you know, getting, getting all sorts of experience in, in nice studios being out here has been great, but now everybody's got a studio at their house, you know, and I, know. I, I get, I get I butterflies know. in my stomach thinking about, man, if I could go back and show my 11 year old self, what I'm playing with now, just it's in my house. It's ready to go all the time. <laughs> I would, my, my 11 year old self would just flip out, you know? No, the same here. I mean, and you know, the learning curve has been challenging because it, it sure. is tough to, uh, to really learn how to be a good engineer and oh, yeah. to be able to mix properly, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's not easy to learn. There's, there's so many yeah. ins and outs of it. And so it's I've taken, you know, I've taken, um, you know, master classes on, uh, on recording, you know, and yeah. it's, uh, and I've, you know, I've been tutored by some good engineers and, um, I've read lots of books and I've, yeah. you know, but nothing beats the experiential at the end of it, you know, actually yeah. doing that yeah. and actually twisting the knobs yourself and seeing if, you know, if it sounds good or not. You know? yeah. And, you know, I've run a lot of my mixes by, you know, other so-called, you know, pro mixers. And, you know, I, I think I've gotten pretty good at it. And, and I'm not just saying that, you know, big headed wise, I'm just saying, it, you know, it's been a lot of learning yeah. that's gotten me to this point, you know, like 20, 30 years worth. And so it's a pretty daunting task. I think when somebody comes and asks me the question, what do I need to do to, to create my own studio, you know? And it's like, man, where do we start? Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's a very, very detailed. Yeah. Um, it, 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 I kind of liken it almost to learning an instrument. You know, you oh, really is, have yeah. to jump in with both feet if you're going to do it. And otherwise, let somebody else do it and pay them, pay them to do it. You know, yeah. otherwise, you know, you're going to be stuck learning it for a long, long time. And, the trial and error thing is, is real. And so, yeah. um, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying that if you have a passion for it and you really want to do it, then by all means, yeah. get the equipment and go for it, do it and, and learn it. Well, I think um, at this point, every musician should be experimenting with recording, whether or not they, they plan on, on, you know, mastering the art of mastering or, uh, you know, <laughs> or getting yeah. adept at mixing it's it's a uh, more of a you know we we've moved beyond the era of of recording ourselves with a boom box in the corner um totally and totally and you know i started off with um <laughs> i was piggybacking tape recorders so that i could oh, multi-track that I way did the same thing with a cheap behringer board a bunch of radio shack microphones and mm -hmm. you know um, I started just playing around with it like that. And then, then the next thing I got was a, a, a hard disk recorder, which was like, you know, full of effects. And you could, you could, you know, I could plug my mixer into that and record drums stereo, not, not multi-track, but then, um, you know, put a guitar line on top of that and then put a bass line on top of that and then, you know, keep stacking it. And, um, yeah. you know, then you just start collecting microphones and like, I started getting, you know, it, I would buy like one nice microphone and go, wow, this is my nicest microphone and start mm -hmm. playing with that and figuring out where, where is the best place to put it? What's the best way to utilize it? And yeah. um, before you know it, you've got a, a locker full of microphones and I know 30 years I worth know. of cable buildup. And, and <laughs> I've sold, I have sold a lot of gear too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in order to attain the things that, you know, I might have researched or read up on or been recommended to. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy right now with, with the microphone setup anyway, you know, that I've got. And uh, I think I think my next step as far as upgrading, if I ever decide to, is to um, maybe go with some different mic pre's. Maybe not mm -hmm. mic, not the external mic pre's, but I'm talking about the... Uh, the focus right stuff. Like mm -hmm. I might 
make the switch to Apollo or, you know, some of the other higher end um, sure. interfaces. Um, I don't think it's really that necessary though, because I think that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of records being made using focus, right? Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause again, those mic breeds are really clean and, yeah. and they're, they're still pretty good. And, you know, they don't have the character of the, uh, you know, like the Neve pre's yeah, yeah. and stuff that I'm, that I'm using, but, um, but they still sound good, you know? There's a, a lot of good results to be had from, from equipment that's, that's not the latest and greatest, but you're still, yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. Well, we've, we've kind of touched on a lot of things, haven't we? So far, I mean, geez, how long have yeah. we been at this? Uh, we've been on for two hours and 10 minutes at this point. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, is there anything else that you'd like to delve into before we adjourn for the evening or um, what? I don't know. Does uh, anybody in the chat have anything else to add? Uh, Matt Skirfield did add that he loves the earthwork stuff and he feels like it really captures such a natural vibe from the drum. It I've does. always been uh, intrigued by by those. I've I've not gotten to play around with them or, or uh, try them out, but um, I've I've always been interested in in the design aspect of it. And and you know, and obviously, I mean, the people that are using them are are, are doing some quality stuff. So I've I've been excited about that. Um, yeah, they just, really do capture very very well. I mean. Yeah probably better than any mic system that I've, that I've used in the past. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely love them and I can't recommend them highly enough. Yeah. I think they're, they're definitely the best drum mic system I've ever used uh, uh, in Matt, the studio. Matt sure. says the only thing he doesn't like about them is the mounts, which I have. The mounts, can... the mounts are a little funky. Are they? Yeah. But, but once you get them, you know, set to where you want them and all, um, it's not that big of a deal, yeah. you know? So yeah, I've got them on my hi hats. I've got my overheads or earthworks, all my tall mics, my snare mic, um, everything. Now I did a recording reason. I just don't have enough earthworks for my whole kit, you yeah, know? Yeah. So I do use a, um, uh, a different mic for the gong drum and uh, I use an, an old audio technica mic for that and yeah. then uh, um, and then what else oh and for my side snare my little soprano snare mm -hmm. um, I'll throw up like one of the uh, either an SM57 or sure. you know one of the um, E604s I'll just snap a couple of them on you know top yeah. and bottom yeah and go for it because they they still those things record so well so yeah i'm, I'm a fan they're workhorses man there <laughs> there's there's nothing wrong with those and the, the audix as well i've used used some of theirs in the past mm -hmm. i still have a d6 that i use i've got an i5 that i use and several of the fusion series which which they're not making anymore but the f10s and f12s um, mm -hmm. I've had for toms or sometimes I've used them for, for vocals behind the kit because it's a lower profile mic. And, uh, um, right. I mean, I'm, I'm endorsing Erland microphones, which is a Swedish company that, that, uh, uses triangular diaphragms and they're, they're just, uh, um, the, the, the theory behind that is, you know, having a triangular diaphragm, uh, prevents, uh, drop something into a round glass of water that the you know the the water ripples back and forth for for quite some time and then if you you know put it in a square the ripple time is dramatically reduced and if you put it in a triangle it's it's reduced again by by like a quotient of 50 percent so it's it's uh the the idea from the engineering standpoint is is to get just the most accurate representation of the sound that you're catching um so, okay. so i'm using a, a, a this is an ehrm um, and then I've got an EHRD and an EHRE. Um, so I've got, a, I've got a few of these mics that are just, man, for overheads, these, these are amazing. They're great for vocals. They're great for 
all, all sorts of things, but, uh, yeah. And, and the, you know, the D and the E are both very, very low profile and, and they all use the, the diaphragms on them are all, uh, look nearly identical, but, uh, mm. the, the circuitry cool. and, the, and the configuration is what, what, uh, what changes between them. But, uh, uh tool have been using them. Meshuggah has been using them. Um, Morgan Ogren's been using them. They're, they're just incredible microphones. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, there's some really cool stuff. There is. Come. There's there's so much out there. Have, do you, there do really you, is. Do you follow S- uh, Sylvia Massey on on uh, Facebook at all? She's, no. Huh? She's a, a, a outstanding engineer and just a, a a microphone aficionado. I mean, she's basically collecting microphones. Like, I mean, she she has the most massive collection that is just. I mean, it's it's fascinating every time she posts a new mic that she's gotten. Um, it, it's really uh, really fascinating, and they've got um, uh, they've got. Oh, we lost the stream for a second. It looks like it's back. Um, she she will do uh, videos of sessions that she's doing just to yeah. show you you know a little bit of behind the scenes. Like uh, there was one where they were recording a full band in uh, the structure of a nuclear cooling tower. So it's basically uh-huh. this empty cooling tower. It's a giant funnel going up into the air, and they set up the drum kit right in the middle of it. Um, r- really cool stuff. Uh, so, you know, just to get to hear the snare drum as it's reverberating all the way up that that uh, that cooling tower. Or It's uh, awesome. There was, there was another video that she did where they used... They used a cell phone in the booth with the vocalist to, you know, send basically send the the cell signal to the uh, to the satellite and back, so that they were they were using the cell phone as as the uh, digital delay for the for the vocalist and and that was in, she she does a lot of very interesting stuff like that. She was the uh, she was the engineer behind um, uh, Undertow with with Tool and and a lot of different uh, a lot of different artists but really oh. fascinating stuff if you're if you're into into microphones or, or recording technology at all she's she's a great one to follow awesome yeah yeah and what was her i'm sorry sylvia, remind me of the name again sylvia massey it's m-a-s-s-y or is it sylvia m-a-s-s-y massey. I'm going to write that down okay yeah m-a-s-s-y Ooh. okay I'll check her out. Cool. Yeah. Right on, man. Well, Mike, we um, have uh, covered a lot of ground here. I we think. have, and I I should let you go. Um, and uh, yeah, I really appreciated you having me on. I mean, this has been a a joy. It's you know, this I've been is... looking forward to this ever since you asked me. Nice. So, uh, well, this is yeah. really fun for me to just talk about, you know, the 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 different life experiences of different artists, and um, you know, to hear hear these different perspectives, and um, you know, what brought you here, and 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 where you're going with it, and what's you know, just mm-hmm. all the aspects of it. I, I could talk about this kind of stuff for hours. So it's it's uh, I really. Oh, uh, me too. Me too. I mean, we could. We could talk bands for hours. We could sure. talk, you know, because yeah. gosh, I mean, you know, we might have got into uh, maybe '60s and '70s bands, but you know, yeah. we haven't even we never jumped into '80s, '90s, or or even modern. Yeah, there's so much, you know, more modern stuff. There's so much great music out there, and, and it's so vast, man. It's just like, you know, it just makes my head spin, you know, and. Yeah. Uh, it's funny because I'm, you know, I'm constantly looking for new music and I still look for new music. You know, a lot of people get set in their ways and they want to only listen to, yeah. you know, what they're used to listening to. But that's, that's so yeah. far from me and my attitude about music, man. I, I love listening to what other people are coming up with. Yeah. Even, even now. And cause there's just so many amazing bands. I mean, oh, I'm getting me and the, in fact, uh, last night we went to um, Universal Bar and Grill in L.A. And, uh, you know, we saw a band out of Chicago called Marbin, M-A-R-B-I-N. 
Yeah. And they're this uh, like jazz fusion guys, okay. you know, and they're all young guys, man. And they're just out there beating the weeds like constantly, you know, they're, they're definitely road dogs. And, you know, there's playing these little tiny places for hardly any money. And, but they're all really great players. And yeah. it was really fun to listen to those guys, you know, so, you know, it's, uh, it's fun to, to sort of explore, you know, what's going on. Yeah. And, uh, so I'm forever curious, you know, what people are doing. And well, I'll tell you, it's, I'm, I'm getting absolutely bombarded with music through, through the streaming because I bet. Um, I'm, we've got people all over the world that tune in and, you know, I'll, I'll keep it to themes for the most part. Um, uh, sometimes I'm a, a lot more loose with it than others, but I'll try and pick a general theme and then um, everybody just sends me what whatever they think fits into that theme. And um, I've been exposed in the last, I mean, I've got, I've got uh, Apple Music you know, a subscription to that. So if it's on Apple music, I can just grab it and put it in the, in the, uh, in the collection. And my recently added just gets, I mean, <laughs> there's Mine's so stupid. much music right now that I'm like, Oh my God, that's amazing. I'm going to listen to that later. And then the next night I'm streaming again and I'm like, Oh my God, I mean, I, this is amazing. I'm going to listen to this later. And, and before yeah. you know it, you've got, you know, a hundred albums to, to check out. And there's no way I can keep up, but I'm, I just, I can't get I enough of this endless stream of different music that I'm, that I didn't know about. And some of it came out before I was born or right around when I was born or last year. And, and it's all stuff that I'm like, how did I not know about this? And yeah, sometimes it's funny, it's, man. I've, I've got a, uh, young bass player friend, his name is Christian. You know, he's in fact, he's the bass player in the who mm -hmm. band that I'm playing in. And, you know, he's like mid twenties but he's like an old soul you know he knows so much so much about music that i grew up with yeah. and and he's turned me on to even a whole bunch of a whole new you know array of music you know that i've yeah. never even heard of and um so i mean gosh there's just so many thousands of bands out there that you know we could tap into it's yeah. it's amazing i think that um you know, the music industry has changed so much and um some for the some for the good and some maybe for the not so good yeah. you know um you do definitely have to weed through i think some some things to get sure. to the really good good stuff sure. um uh, bill and, gerwig just stopped in the chat and says ted awesome player i think uh, oh. he's he's a uh, i think he's in uh, san diego actually Bill Gerwig. Oh. oh, thank you, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. Bill's a really nice guy. He, uh, he, uh, he, I think he, he sat next to my wife for the, for the last pet shark show and he was, uh, yeah, he was a good guy. He was helpful that night and, uh, yeah, he's a nice dude for nice. sure. Yeah, definitely. So hello, Bill. Welcome. What fun. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I um, <laughs> I don't know what else to cover at this point either. Um, I'm kind of sorry that I didn't uh, have the, the. I don't know what what the deal is with the with the audio. I had I wanted to have that like playing underneath while we were talking. In the last last stream I did, we had that worked out just perfect. And I, this is same setup and <laughs> so always always these little these little gremlins. Yeah, no to worries, figure man. Out. But yeah. Well, I uh, I wish you a good night, man, and thank you so much again for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for coming it's, on to the uh, to the to the show. It's uh, it's uh, very fun for me, and and uh, we like we like uh, talking about all this stuff. So. Well, equally as fun for me, I think that we could you know we could probably spend fifteen hours you know probably, talking yeah. about all this stuff because yeah. uh, you know I could go on forever. It's just that uh, I don't want to. I don't want to keep you too long. Well, but, maybe uh, uh, maybe we'll finish out the thing with the uh, with your your soul tone um, video, the Carnivore Cruises. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah it's interesting. On. We 
we actually um, went and recorded that when the song was not yet recorded. That was pretty soon after we had just written the tune. And um, um, yeah, Keith, the guitar player, and I wrote that song. Well, we wrote all of them together. And um, um, that's a really, really fun song to play as it goes on. You know, it's it's really a fun tune to play. It's yeah. got a lot of different, you know, time signatures and stuff like that. And you can kind of figure some of that stuff out. And crazy enough, I used, I actually used um, an electric kit in the uh, in the mid section mid section breakdown of that song. Okay. Uh, you might be able to to pick it out. It's got the it's the kit that has kind of a flange effect on it. All right. That I that I mixed into that. And, on the um, on the soul tone video. Uh, no 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 I'm sorry yeah, yeah. on the album I'm yeah, sorry yeah, okay. on the album. Yeah. Um, on the Soul Tone video, no. That's just us banging the song out right yeah. after we wrote it. So I want to give the viewers some some visual along with the uh, with the audio, which is why I suggested that one. But uh, right on, man. Yeah, do it. And, All right. Uh, well, well, we'll let that play the uh, play the stream out. And uh, okay, cool. Again, thank well, you, uh, thank you for joining. And uh, thanks again for having me, man. I'll, yeah. I'll see you out there and uh, look forward to. Uh, having some coffee with you in person yeah. here soon. Hopefully. Very soon, yes. And we had talked about maybe uh, doing some, you know, fixing some, doing some something with your drums. Yeah, the uh, uh, I've got I've got an old Pearl kick drum that I haven't been using for years, and uh, I would like to to make a little a little gong drum out of that. And, and uh, well, you're welcome to come over, and we'll uh, we'll knock it out one all day. Right. We got to make it a plan. That sounds good. I'll man. be in touch then. I appreciate you, man. I appreciate the friendship. No worries, and, uh, man. Likewise. I'm, I'm happy to know you. Well, pleasure's mine. All right, everybody. All right, that's brother. Ted Morton. And uh, if if you've got, um, and th this will be up on on uh, YouTube after after we upload it um, when we're all done. And uh, yeah, cool, very man. good. <laughs> all right. So, uh, well, we'll see you soon. Yeah. You guys have likewise. a great night. And uh, we'll let the uh, video play it out, and and uh, hope y'all enjoy. <laughs>
All right, folks. I'm going to sign off for tonight, and uh, we'll be back uh, possibly tomorrow night. To do what? I don't know. We're going to figure out uh, some sort of a theme and run with it. If not, I will be back on uh, Friday or... Wait, tomorrow's Wednesday. Wow, it's only Tuesday. Jeez, okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, Glack Bamer, sorry. This was a uh, an interview night. So I'm going to I'm gonna uh, sign off here and we will uh, we'll be back. We'll be back tomorrow. Yeah, for Wednesday. Of course I'm going to stream on Wednesday. Sorry, Glack Bamer. <laughs> Next time. Um, yeah. So let's uh <laughs> Let's go somewhere else. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye, guys. Hello. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Cut that out.